We have a little song that um, we used to sing in Sunday school. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Did y'all ever hear that one? For the Father up above is looking down with love. And it's important because what we experience on a day-to-day basis definitely gets into our hearts and into our minds, doesn't it? How many of you ever get a song stuck in your head and you can't get it out of your head? How many of you ever have a song that gets stuck in your head for no apparent reason? You don't know where it came from or why. It's some song that you heard one time when you were four and a half years old and all of a sudden here it is. Maybe you can think of part of the words. Maybe you can't. Maybe you just make up half the words like I do. It's, um, it's just something that, that's there and you don't know why. It just seems random, but sometimes... Surprise, there is a reason for it. Sometimes it's not just a random occurrence and the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you something or teach you something through those little melodies and things that get stuck in your head. I had that to happen to me a while back. And, and sometimes, you know, and I'm, I'm a very musical. I, I sing and, and, uh, and lead worship. And so music's a big part of my life, a big part of, of my ministry. And I thoroughly enjoy it. So it can be just something, something crazy like you're sitting at the dinner table Haven't thought of this song in a hundred years. And someone says, wow, this steak is really tender. This steak is so tender. And all of a sudden it hits you. Love me tender. Love me true. Never let me go. And then for the next three days, you're, you're singing love me tender. It's crazy how that works. And how many of you have musical windshield wipers? Anybody else? Am I the only one? It's a rainy day and all this, and your, your windshield wipers are going back and forth. Wish, 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 wish. And you just, all of a sudden you realize they're playing your song, apparently. And they're just like this over and over again. And you know, it's wake up in the morning and I stumble to the kitchen, pour myself a cup of ambition, then stretch and yawn and try to come to life. Why are they playing that song? <laughs> Working nine to five. <laughs> so uh, anyway, a few months ago, <laughs> a few months ago, I had this song to pop into my head and it was an old hymn. So that's better than a Dolly Parton song, right? It was an old hymn that um, I haven't sang in, I don't know, 20, 30 years maybe. And it, it was the, the song Near the Cross. Does anybody know that one? Near the Cross. Um, If you know it, you can sing along with me. I'll sing a little bit faster than usual. It says, Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream. Flows from Calvary's mountain, near the cross, near the cross. Be my glory ever till my soul shall find peace beyond. Y'all know it. It's a beautiful hymn. And nothing that I'm about to say should take away from that because the hymn in and of itself is, is perfectly wonderful and fine. And, and uh, however, I don't know why it came into my head or I didn't know, but I later realized That it wasn't by coincidence that it was the Holy Spirit bringing that into my spirit to get me started on this sermon. I'll elaborate some on that in just a moment. But before we do that, let's have a history lesson. Because what's an anointed church service without a history lesson, right? In the 1760s, Great Britain was in deep debt. So the British Parliament imposed a series of taxes on American colonists to help pay those debts. It was called the Stamp Act of 1765, and it taxed the the American colonists on virtually every piece of printed paper that they used, from playing cards to licenses to newspapers and even to legal documents. The Townsend Acts of 1767 went a step further, taxing essentials such as paper and paint and glass and lead, and T. The British government felt that these taxes were fair since much of its debt was earned by fighting wars on the colonists' behalf. The colonists, however, disagreed. They were furious at being taxed without having any representation in Parliament. You've heard of taxation without representation? 
and they felt that it was wrong for Great Britain to impose these taxes on them to gain revenue. The Boston Tea Party, don't you love that? The Boston Tea Party? The Boston Tea Party was a political protest that occurred on December 16, 1773 at Griffin's Wharf in Boston, Massachusetts. You probably remember this from elementary school history class, but the Boston Tea Party was when American colonists, frustrated and angry at this taxation without representation, sneaked into the harbor onto a ship, and they dumped 342 chests of tea imported by the British East India Company into the harbor. The event was the first major act of defiance to to British rule over the colonists. It showed Great Britain that Americans wouldn't take taxation and tyranny sitting down. They rallied American patriots across the 13 colonies to fight for independence. Fast forward a few pages of the history book later, and there was a war. It was a war that was quite revolutionary. That's probably why they called it the Revolutionary War. Tonight, my sermon title is Move the T. Move the T. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, I hate it when he says turn to my neighbor and say stuff. (laughs) I thought that was hilarious. (laughs) Go with me if you would to, you know what, don't even bother turning there. I'll just tell you what it says. Uh, I I am, if you desire to, though, in Exodus, um, Exodus chapter 19. It's talking about when the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses, you know what he did? He went up, as one does when the Lord calls you to the top of the mountain. Then God on the mountain, he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The law was poured out. Did you hear me? The law was poured out at Mount Sinai. The law was a good thing. The law was an important event. The giving of the law that day was absolutely necessary. Galatians 3 and 19 tells us why the law was given. The great design of the law was that the promise of, of the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to those that believe. That being convinced of their guilt and the insufficiency of the law to effect a righteousness for them, they might be persuaded to believe on Christ and so obtain the benefit of the promise. That was a lot of words, but basically what that's saying is that the law was given so that we would know what it was to sin. Without the giving of the law, there was no no hardcore evidence of what was wrong and what wasn't wrong. That's That was the purpose of, of the law being given. Without the law, there would have been no breaking of the law. You can't break a law that hasn't been given, right? And without the breaking of the law, there would have been, there would have been no convincing of mankind's guilt from sin. There would have been no understanding of the law to effect a righteousness for us, and, and we would not have been able to acknowledge the need for a Christ. A Christ meaning a Messiah. A Messiah meaning a Savior. So without the giving of the law, there would be no necessity for a Savior. And without a Savior, you and I would not have the ability to inherit the gift of eternal life. So are you thankful for the giving of the law? Amen. Me too. So the giving of the law was absolutely essential. It was absolutely important. It was a good thing. It was not a bad thing. The Scripture tells us that God's law or God's Torah or Torah was perfect. But it's important to understand why it was given in the first place. Don't you agree? What happened there at Mount Sinai was good. But y'all, it wasn't the final stop. That wasn't all the story. There was more. There on the mountain at Mount Sinai, something important happened. But I'm glad that we didn't stop there, aren't you? 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 17 through 18, it says, Now the the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Y'all know this? 
There is freedom. There is liberty, depending on which translation you're using. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Emancipation from bondage. Freedom. And all of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the Word of God, as in the mirror, the glory of God, we're constantly, and this is important, we're constantly being transfigured into His very own image in ever-increasing splendor, and from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So, in easy English, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And because of our relationship with Him, He transforms us, He transfigures us from glory to glory. You know, glory to glory means from level of existence to level of existence. So, Think of it as mountaintops. He transforms us. He transports us from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop. You know what's in between mountains, though, don't you? Valleys. That's another sermon, but I just thought I would point that out. We go from mountain to mountain. We go from glory to glory, from level of existence to level of existence. Thank God that we don't have to get stuck in one place and stay there for all of the rest of what we are, for all of eternity. From here to there, but that doesn't stop. We go on to the next place. So thank God for Sinai and what happened there, the outpouring of the law. But thank God that we didn't have to get stuck there, although a lot of people have. And I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry, but, but a lot of people get stuck at Mount Sinai. Even Christians, even those who, who have seemingly moved on, they get stuck right there at Sinai in the giving of the law. And they, and they believe that they can attain better relationship with God. And they try to do it. Instead of trying to do it from the inside out, they try to do it from the outside in with really, really good intentions. But they think if I don't wear this and I don't cut this and I make sure that this is this length and that's not that color and, and, and this is that particular material and you know what I'm talking about. They think that that, that outwardness is going to somehow get onto the inside and, and, and that, that law, whether biblical law or, or modern day misinterpretation of a law, that it's going to cause them to be in better relationship. It's going to cause them to to be in righteousness. Whereas, of course, we know that it's just the opposite. Relationship comes in here and then it, it works its way out. And because of relationship, we begin to keep the ordinances and the, the beliefs of our Father because we know that it's His best plan for us. Amen? That's how that works. So there's no need to get stuck there. When you have a better understanding of the scripture, you can move on. Do you know why we want to move on past, past Sinai, don't you? Of course, because the next mountain is, well, it's Calvary. And where would we be without Mount Calvary and what happened there? That's, that's an, I mean, the giving of the law was spectacular. That was a history-changing situation. That was a glorious place. But you know what? Mount Calvary, I dare say it was an even more glorious place. We must move on. We know at Mount Calvary, Jesus poured out his blood for you and me. He died. He took the place that we deserve to be so that we get to take the place of where he deserved to be. He called his father God so that we could call God our father. He got the wages of sin, the punishment for sin, which was death. And we get what he deserved, which is eternal life. Thank God for Mount Calvary. Jesus was crucified for our transgressions. But, and bear with me, we must not get stuck at Mount Calvary. Now I done went to offending somebody and talk, talking ugly, hadn't I? We must not get stuck at Mount Calvary. We must not get nailed to the old rugged cross atop Golgotha's hill. Instead, we must proceed on to the next mountain that God has for us. But just... Because we aren't stuck at Calvary doesn't mean that, that we leave Calvary behind. Not at all. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of it, forget himself and his own interests, and take up his cross and follow me. You see, 
Jesus didn't say to stay right there and follow me. You can't follow if you're staying still. He said to take up your cross and go, follow me. It's the cause of what happened at Mount Calvary that we're born again. Without it, we just couldn't be. But yet again, many people, congregations, churches are stuck there. Now, here's what I mean by that. And that's where that song comes in, by the way. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Again, beautiful song, but for the purposes of of what the Holy Spirit dropped it into my spirit for, I thought about it and I thought, you know, in this sense, I don't want to be near the cross. I don't want to be stuck near a piece of wood. I don't want to be stuck at Mount Calvary. And for anyone who thinks I'm being blasphemous, let me just tell you, I want to be like Jesus. And you know who ain't at Calvary? Jesus. You can go. He just ain't there. In fact, you can go to the the place that he went immediately after Calvary. The tomb. Guess what? Also not there, is he? Yeah. He's not at Calvary and he's not at the tomb. We can't get stuck at Calvary. And Calvary is responsible for our salvation experience. It's responsible for our new birth. Here's what I'm saying. That is not the end. Being saved, being born again, becoming a new man, that's not where it stops, y'all. There's a whole lot more than just a born-again experience. Now, I'm not, I'm not making light of a born-again experience. I'm just telling y'all that we serve a good, good God who said, I'm going to give you everything, and then I'm going to give you some more. That's plus one service, amen? Everything plus some. It's because of what happened there that we are born again. So, Jesus, don't so much keep me near the cross, just let me be near you. Wherever you are, I'm going to take up my cross, and I'm going to follow you. Without what happened at Mount Calvary, we, would, we, we wouldn't be able to be saved. But again, we don't need to stay at Mount Calvary forever. Church, we've got other mountains to climb. Don't you agree? We must go by Calvary, but we must not get stuck there. And again, we don't leave Calvary behind. We, we take that experience with us all the days of our lives. Now, after, after Calvary, let's see, there was a glory after that, wasn't there? You can probably know where I'm going with this. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Let's go to Mount Zion. How about that? There's still fire on Mount Zion. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded as the multitude tends to get when Christian folks are around. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans? And how is it that we now hear each of these men speaking in our own native tongue, even though, in my parentheses, they have not been taught these languages? Even though even though they shouldn't be able to speak it, they are. You know what's going on here? They thought these people have been drinking the sweet wine. That's what has happened. And it's a shame because it's, it's, look at what time it is. I mean, I've heard of drinking, but this is ridiculous. And I still don't understand the language factor, but wow. Wow. What is with these people? Well, thank goodness for St. Peter. St. <laughs> <Saint> Peter. <laughs> thank goodness for, for the apostle Peter who jumped up and began to preach. And he said, y'all, you are mistaken. They're not drunk as you suppose. They're just filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what's going on here. That's what's happening. This is what, remember Joel, you know, you learned about in in, uh, Sabbath school or wherever you went to learn that in the end, the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all flesh, black flesh, white flesh, red flesh, yellow flesh. That's what's happening here. This is what Joel was talking about. 
That was an awesome, awesome experience. Now, what if we had stopped at, at Mount Sinai? And then, even if we moved on, what if we had stopped at Mount Calvary? Clinging. It would be good to go to heaven, but y'all, it's better to go to heaven with, with everything that God wants you to have. Well, now that we've had the Mount Zion experience, what are we going to do with it? What would we be today, church, without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Well, we wouldn't be spirit-filled, I'll tell you that. We'd have to find some other arrangements, wouldn't we? How many of you remember when you, when you first received the fullness, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I hope you haven't forgotten. If you've forgotten, then go ahead and just get rebaptized. Go back in. Amen? Well, now that we've got it, let's use it. The Lord didn't pour out fire on that mountain in that upper room just so that we could speak in other languages. That's an important, important gift, but that wasn't the only, he didn't, he didn't pour it out just so that we could get a chill. He didn't pour it out just so that we could and have an enjoyable worship service. The Holy Spirit provides power to affect change in this old sinful world. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. It is power for service. It is power to change the way that this place operates. The scripture refers to us as being salt of the earth. And this, this world, this earth, the people thereof are damaged and hurt. It's like a big gaping wound on the surface of the planet. And you know what it's like when you get salt in a wound? It helps, doesn't it? It's a purifier. can even be used as an antibiotic. But it burns just a bit, doesn't it? And, and you probably, especially if you don't, aren't, aren't fully aware of what's going on, you're, try, you're trying to wash it out, aren't you? You're trying to, trying to get rid of it. Because it burns. It's a bit unpleasant. But what you don't realize is that you need it there. It's needed. The wound needs to be cleansed. Let me break it down to you like this. This world that we live in right now, as you know, if you, unless you've been living under a rock, which some days seems preferable, I realize. You know how this world feels about you, don't you? How this world feels about the church, the kingdom of God. We're not very popular. Not as popular as we used to be. Think about it this way. In our culture, we are not allowed to discriminate, at least in this country, against any group of people, right? We're not allowed to discriminate against people in terms of gender, gender confusion, satanic possession. We're not allowed to discriminate in terms of ethnic backgrounds, race, disabilities, age. We're not allowed to discriminate against people because of the number of children they have. Do you know that in job interviews now, the new trend, I, I, I uh, in my job, I have to interview people, as some of you probably do. The new trend is you're not even supposed to ask people if they have dependable transportation. You're not even, because it could be discrimination. You're not allowed to ask people what they made at their last job so that you'll know what to pay them because it, it's, not, it's considered discrimination. It's considered unfair. I'm not saying that these are all bad things. I'm just saying that's the way it is. The world does not discriminate. We live in a very enlightened kind of culture, don't we? And, you know, you are not even allowed to discriminate against people because of their religion or their religious beliefs unless they're Christian, at which point it's pretty much open season. Right? You can be Buddhist or Muslim or atheist and you have your rights. And you can be Christian and you're hated. They're working every day to strip us of the rights that we have left. 
this world does not want what the church is here to provide. Do you know that? This world does not want the peace that is part of our Christian experience. This world does not want the righteousness, the right standing that, that Jesus died to give us. And this world does not want the joy in the Holy Ghost that is rightfully ours. This world does not want any part of the church of the living God until they can't pay their electrical bill. Yes, this is Pastor Randall. How can I help you? I'm sorry to hear that. Well, how much do you need? Now, who is this? Were you there Sunday? Sunday before? Oh, you've never been. Oh, well, what did your pastor say? About? Oh, you don't have a pastor. Oh, okay. Well, let me pray about that. I'm so sorry. Okay. Silver and gold have I none, but <laughs> such as I have give I, hello. <laughs> when they can't pay their, or until there's a national emergency. And then, hello, church. Where are you? You're supposed to be the church. You're supposed to be Christians. You're supposed to be the children of the most high God. Where's our free handout? We're going to need that now. Salvation Army, we made fun of you until now, but hey, we're going to need some stuff. Yeah, come and rescue us. Until there's no money to buy Christmas presents for the kids. I won't call the name of it, but there is a, a really large church in Texas that a few years ago during the, what was it, hurricane, right? Yeah, during the hurricane, they got just ripped apart by the media because they didn't open the doors of the church as soon as the public thought that they should open the doors of the church. Because people wanted to come and use the church as a sanctuary. And they did open the doors of the church a couple of days later, but this is a very large church and they have legal advisors and they did not want for liability reasons to, to risk someone being there when that area could flood. My point is not to take up for that particular church. They had their reasons is my only point. But they did eventually open the doors. But nonetheless, they got just torn apart by the media. I mean, all of a sudden, you're not the most beloved preacher. You're not the most wonderful church anymore. You're full of hate and, and horribleness because you didn't let all these people come and, and sleep and live for days inside your, your sanctuary and corridors. Here's the ironic part about that. Those people who were trying to get in, who were so angry that they couldn't get in, most of them had never even been there before. Here, here, here's the real ironic part about that. Those doors that were closed and they were so upset, those doors are, were, were open every Sunday and every Wednesday and, and, every, and, 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 well, at that church, probably every day of the week for year after year after year after year, and no one was interested. And so when God closed the door of the ark, wait a minute, that's a different story. But when there's a need, they demand our resources, don't they? Don't want what we have. Don't want us to have a voice. They don't want us in politics. They don't want us, certainly don't want us to win in politics and be in government. They don't want us in the public schools. They don't want us anywhere in this world except on the giving end of the charity line. That's where they want us. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like taxation without representation. Don't you agree? I think it's time that we move the tea, y'all. I've about had enough. Enough is enough. Let's go take care of some stuff. Anybody with me? Enough of that junk. It's time to have a tea party. Move the tea, in case you haven't figured that out. It means to take a stand. It means to fight back. It means stop doing what you've always done and getting what you've always got. It means let's begin to have a shift in the paradigm, a shift in our way of thinking. Because the way that we've been thinking, guys, it doesn't seem to be working like it used to. 
I think it's time that we change something. Don't you agree? I think it's time that we did something different. Battles are won on the battlefield. But wars are won in the, uh, in the war room. Did that sink in yet? It wasn't that profound. I'm just wondering if it sunk in. Battles are won on the battlefield, but wars are won in the war room. We need to work on our strategy and our planning. God gave us minds. He gave us creativity that, that doesn't just rival that of the world, but I believe it exceeds that of the world because we can go beyond what the world can go in that we have the anointing. We have the Holy Spirit. So you take natural giftings and abilities, you add anointing of the Holy Spirit to it, we can blow away the world. Not that that's our goal. I'm just saying. We, we could with, with, with what the church can produce. But it doesn't just happen. God wants us to win the, the battle, and God wants us to win the war. And you think, well, I'm just going to sit here, and, and I believe, because I have, I have faith, that God will provide, and God will take care of the situation. I don't, have to, I don't have to stress over whatever battle I'm in, because God is God, and God is good, and God has the cattle on a thousand hills. But y'all, God's not going to do anything by himself. I want to be his hands. I want to be his feet. I want to go where he leads me. Go where he leads me. If God were going to take care of it all on his own, well, I'm glad he doesn't because he wouldn't need us, would he? We're the church, the hands and feet of Jesus. Sure, God could do it. But God's not going to do it all on his own. He depends on us to follow the leading, the prompting, the prodding, the behooving, of the Holy Spirit. So 2019 is just about over. God still has victories, I believe, planned and intended for us in 2019. I don't want to discount that at all. I told, I told Grace Point that this morning. But 2020, and from a marketing standpoint, oh my goodness, I know I'm not the only one on this, bag, on this uh, bandwagon, but 2020... I mean, we need to see clearly in 2020, don't you think? We need to see, see clearly. That, that, talk about a vision. Boy, Vision Sunday is going to be big this year, y'all. <laughs> we need to call Hugh Downs and Barbara Walters and say, can you make a guest appearance? This is the 2020 year. You know what I'm talking about? This is going to be an amazing year. And I really believe that God is going to make, uh, through you and through me, God is going to do some amazing things in 2020. But it starts when we start. So how about if, are y'all familiar with, with out of the box, outside the box thinking, outside the box mentality? You see, sometimes we get stuck inside a box and, and we think that the whole world is that box and, and we, don't, we don't acknowledge or, or, or deal with anything that's not in that box. You know what I'm talking about, Pastor Beverly. Yeah. Yeah, and everything else is just irrelevant or, or non-existent to us. It's just about our little box. And sometimes the box is, is small and plain, and sometimes the box has got pews in it, you know? But if we were to start shifting the way that we perceive and realize that there's a world outside the box, either that or, or our, our box could be big enough to envelop the whole, the whole world, you know, like Jesus' was, yeah, and we're good about that because we know the cliche, like, don't put God in a box, right? We know that one. And, and we haven't gotten so bad about putting God in a box because we know God can. Yeah. Won't he do it? Yeah, he will. He will and he has. God can. Amen. <laughs> but we put ourselves in a box is, is the problem now. We put ourselves inside, in, inside those four walls. And how about Love United? If we start having a tea party on a regular basis, like once a, I don't know, hour, and we start moving the tea in our thinking and in our hearts every single day, every single hour of the day, something worth doing is worth doing well, don't you think? Got a few suggestions. You may have heard this before, the start and stop. Let's evaluate and let's decide a few things that we're going to start in 2020 and a few things that we're going to stop. So here goes. I already said the first one. Start thinking outside the box. Not God, 
but ourselves are in that box. God can do it, but he won't until we let him do it through us. If it is to be, it is up to me. Nine little two-letter words that change everything. You could even say, if it is to be, it is up to us. We can't do anything without God, and he won't do anything without us. Time to move the T. Realize and remember that the church is not limited to these four walls. Have y'all heard of the, um, what's that thing? The, uh, oh, the internet. Have y'all heard of that? Isn't that cool? It's been around for, for, for a few years now. It's amazing. That's just one example. Do you know that when the internet, and I know y'all know what the internet is. I was being sarcastic, but, but, but the, the internet has been around. <laughs> yeah, n- no one responded like I thought they would on that. So let me just acknowledge that I do know you know what it is. Do you know that when God, when, when the internet was created, it did not surprise God. God didn't look down at the people tinkering with the computers and the, and the telecommunication lines and go, huh, I wonder if that could be used for my purposes. No, I believe that it is a gift from God. As with any gift, I mean, any gift, it can be corrupted and polluted. Just, I mean, look at sexuality. That's a gift from God, and people do all kinds of horrible things with it, right? Just to pick a random example. <laughs> but the internet, I believe it. Just like television, you know, a gift from God. Gifts are good if you use them for what they're intended for. Not so much if you don't. Guys, you know what happened last night? I, now, I... I'm going to, I'm going to keep humble, but I have become a YouTuber. You know, I have become a YouTube, YouTube content creator. Um, people, uh, that was a joke by the way, because anybody, anybody, literally anybody can do that. Okay. If if y'all don't, if y'all aren't familiar with that. Um, but I've been posting, you know, our services, messages and sermons and stuff online and, um, people from around the world have been watching and contacting me and and messaging me. And last night, just to give you an example of what can happen, I led a man to the Lord in my living room. Here's the thing. He wasn't in my living room. He was in Africa. He was in Africa. He, I don't know if he was using a translate, uh, program on his, on, uh, What's the uh, Facebook? I don't know if he was using a translating program or if he just, you know, spoke perfect English. But via text through Facebook Messenger, uh, I had I was just reaching out asking him to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And at the end of my little message, it said, if you have any questions or need prayer, please let me know. And he said, I need prayer. And I said, OK, what in particular do you need pray to pray about? He said, I want to know God. Well, guess who knows God and was able to introduce him? That's me. I led him through the plan of salvation. And now there's another soul in the kingdom. I had just told the church the week before, if all of this stuff that we're doing online reaches one little old lady in Puxatawney, Pennsylvania, it will all be worth it. Well, I don't know about the lady in Puxatawney. Hopefully she found a church to go to today. But this guy in Africa is now in the kingdom of God. Don't get me wrong. None of that is, is, none of that is to, to brag. I have a, a, a friend, um, who, uh, a lady in ministry that I know who leads, I mean, like every week she's leading someone to Christ through, through her, her ministry. That, that's, and this is, and we're just, we're just one in. But my point is that, that this is a tool that God can and is using and we need to embrace it instead of rejecting it. Shift our way of thinking. The internet is here to stay. Television is here to stay. I like the way that Paul and angels are messengers, right? I like the way that Paul and Jan Crouch used to say that their satellite was that prophetic angel that was flying through the heavens proclaiming the gospel to to all nations. I used to think that was a bit far-fetched when I was younger. And then, you know, I started to, to understand better. And it's like, you know what? Angels are messengers. That thing's sending out a bunch of messages. I think that's pretty spectacular. (laughs) 
We need to start thinking outside the box. Okay, let's talk about something we need to stop. How about this? We need to stop measuring success by how many seats are filled in our church on a Sunday morning. Pastor Jack, you preach just as anointed when there are four people here or when there are 400 people here, don't you? Success, and I want, I mean, I want a church full of people, don't get me wrong, but we need to stop measuring success by how many people are in the seats at our church on a Sunday morning, and we need to start measuring success by the impact that we are making in our community on a daily basis. Love United, okay? All right? Because God didn't call us to the Great Commission to go ye therefore into all the world preaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? He didn't call us to do that just on Sunday morning, right? That's, that's kind of like a um, all the time kind of thing, every day of the week, all the hours, 24 7, 365.25, if you average leap you're in, 365.25 days a year, right? Stop measuring success by how many seats are filled and start measuring success by the lives that are being changed in our community. And you can think, well, if we don't count how many people are here on a Sunday morning and then we don't do anything in the community, how are we going to know if we're being successful or not? Let me tell you, um, it's easy. You're not being successful. If the community is not being changed, I'm not talking to you specifically. I'm talking to every church and all of the kingdom of God. But if, if lives and hearts are not being changed and people are not coming to know the Lord, we're not being successful. Not like we need to be successful. Can, can I get an, an amen? At least a half, halfway amen on that. We, we, need, we need to do what is effective. Because doing and doing and doing and planning and plotting and, 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 and having lots of efforts, that's all admirable. But you know what's even better than doing all of that? It's getting results. So whatever it takes to get results, if it's not illegal or immoral, sometimes you have to <laughs> clarify that. You, 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 need to, you need to go for that, right? We've got a great commission to live out. Start measuring success by the impact that we're making in the community every day. We need to seize the 167. Are you all familiar with that? Seize the 167. Stop focusing. Here's another one, slightly related. But stop focusing on the one hour a week that we spend in church. Or two hours if you're a faithful Wednesday attender. But we'll just say one, you know, to get most people. Um, stop focusing on the one hour a week that you spend at church and start focusing on the 167 other hours of the week that you spend outside the church. 167 hours in a week, 168 in a week. And, and good, go to church. Absolutely. Be faithful, be supportive. Let's do the church thing. Jesus gave us the church. I just did a sermon series about the church earlier this year. I believe in the church, which is good considering I'm a pastor probably, right? I believe in the church, but y'all, there are 167 other hours out there every week. And if you multiply that times the number of days in a year, you get a big number that I didn't do the math beforehand on, but it's a big number. There are a lot of hours a lot of hours in the year. And if we, just the people who were in this room, could start to focus on doing the work of our Lord and Savior, who did the work necessary for us to attain eternal life, I mean, we kind of should feel a little bit obligated, right? 167 more hours. Don't skip church. That's important. Christ ordained. But don't stop there. That's a challenge to you and to me. I'm challenging you tonight, challenging the kingdom of God in Meridian, Mississippi, in Lauderdale County. Let's go beyond the box. Let's go beyond our four walls. We need to have a tea party. Anybody ready? No, I mean, really, don't, don't say you are if you aren't. Just, just get ready and then say you are. Yeah, it's time to move the tea. You know what? In fact, I was thinking about moving the tea, and, and here's, what, here's what came to me. Here, Y'all are going to love this if you don't pretend that you do, okay? And then later say, I didn't understand that. But don't tell me because it will hurt my feelings. Here, here's, here's what we need to do. We're love what? United. You know what? That, and that's wonderful. We need to remain being united. We need to get more united. That's, that's awesome. But you know what would happen if we take love and then... United. U-N-I-T-E-D. U-N-I-T-E-D. We need to move the T. Move it one letter to the left. All we have to do is get over I. That's poignant. Move it one letter to the left. And instead of united, U-N-I-T-E-D, we need to be love. U-N-T-I-E-D. Love 
I'll spell it again for you, those who are not quite as sharp, okay? I'm kidding. U-N-T-I-E-D. You're going to be love untied. You know why we need to be that? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Woman, thou art loosed. Um, and by the way, men, thou art loosed as well. Because we, look, we won't get untied. We won't get unbound. We won't get free unless we're first united. And we've been working on that for a few years now, haven't we? So now let's move that T. Ready? Will you stand with me? We go from glory to glory to glory. From Sinai to Calvary. From Calvary to Zion. And from Zion to, oh, yeah, we're not done yet, are we? We're going to be walking through a mountain. You know what, which mountain I'm talking about? Mount of Olives. Have y'all heard of that one? Yeah, because Jesus is come, coming back and uh, he's going to set foot down. It's going to split in two. And then we're going to go through it. Just read Revelation. It's not one of the most popular scriptures. But, but we're not done yet. There's a whole other additional level of glory that we can go to. Are we going to get to that Mount of Olives experience? Are we going to hold through to the end? Are we going to be true? Are we going to move enough? <laughs> Are we going to move enough tea to make a difference? Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, shift our thinking, reorganize our thoughts, orchestrate not just something, but some things in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, in our creative processes this year, Lord, in 2019, that will prepare us for 2020. God, I know that you are not limited to what we can think of. You are not limited to what we can perceive even. But Father, you have all the power, all the glory is yours. Everything that we need to accomplish, this thing that you have called us to do, this great commission, Father, even, even just in this city and in this county, Father, we know that it's all at our fingertips. All we have to do is take part in it. In Jesus' name, Lord, give us the drive, give us the ambition, give us the love, Lord, the untied and the united love to do what you have called us to do, Father. That's all we need is just to do what you've asked us to do, Lord. Just what you've asked us to do in the name of Jesus. Amen.